people have more food again, but they still go back to school. In those days, everybody used the agar-agar method. Yeah. Hello everybody, my name is Patty and I'm a librarian with the National Library Board and you are watching From Book to Cook, a cooking show where we learn about Singapore's history through food. In today's episode, we will be making two tapioca dishes, but they're not found in any recipe book in our collection. And that's because they come from a period where writing cookbooks was not exactly a priority. We will be looking at wartime recipes from the Japanese occupation of Singapore. During the occupation, food shortage was a major problem and staples like rice were in short supply. As a result, people turned to tapioca to replace rice. With me today to talk about this is Lee Gyok Boy, author of many cookbooks and books on Singapore's wartime history. Let's go meet our guest for today. Hi, Gyok Boy. Hi. I understand you've written more than 10 cookbooks and uh, you've also written, I think, three books about Singapore's history, particularly the Japanese occupation period. Could you tell me more about those books? So the Japanese occupation uh, project was given to me in 1991. So I thought, oh, this is very interesting. But of course, I knew nothing about it. But I had the help of the Oral History Centre because in the 1980s, they had interviewed Japanese occupation survivors. Basically, they formed the content for the three books on, that I have done on the Japanese occupation. And I understand there was a reason why tapioca is used so much during that period. Could you tell, care to share? Singapore has always imported its food supplies. We don't grow rice, which is the staple in Singapore to this day. Tapioca can be grown in Singapore. Right. It grows well on, on relatively poor soil. And so during the occupation, Japanese occupation, there was a shortage of rice. But tapioca was the, the staple substitute because it's filling and it's a starch. Everybody had to queue up for rations. Mm -hmm. Getting food you know, was a very complicated process. They would announce in the Shonan Times uh, the following stuff was going to be distributed or whatever. Except that uh, you had to like, make sure that you got some of it, which meant lining up mm. as early as you could to be at the front of the queue. So what, so what do they do then if they can't get anything? The, the mayor of Singapore, they decided to try to start a little settlement elsewhere. So there were two. One was Endau which was a big success. Mm -hmm. The other was Bahau, which was a total failure. And that was a success partly because I think the land was better. Mm -hmm. There were also leader, community leaders who, who kind of knew something about agriculture. Whereas Bahau was made up of, of Eurasians and uh, Chinese Christians. Mm. And I guess they were too urbanised to know much about farming. Yeah. You know? With food being so controlled, was there like a black market or something? So yes, there was a very thriving black market. But how, how did these black markets operate? I, I would go to a guy, you, you, you knew who they were. You know, it could be your neighbour's son or whatever. You would say, I'm looking for whatever you're looking for. And he would know who has what you needed to exchange for the uh, that particular thing that you are looking for. Mm. Um, there was another thing that I wanted to ask you about, which was the food shortages affected everyone in Singapore at the time. Um, but it was one particular group of uh, people as well, which were the prisoners of war. There was a book I think that you came across, a cookbook made by prisoners of war. There were two categories of, of uh, inter... One were the civilian internees which was made out of women, children and so on, of the uh, enemy countries. Uh, then the other lot were the prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. These were the soldiers who had been captured, you know, uh, when, when the, the, the British surrendered. Amongst the, the uh, civilian internees, one of the things that they did was, they had a board in which they wrote down recipes <laughs> for foods that they would love to get their hands on, which of course they didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, but they wrote them all down anyway. And so people could just go there and gaze at it longingly and I suppose imagine 
a time when they could actually get their hands on this particular food. The prisoners of war were, of course, severely uh, malnourished. Mm. You can see from the pictures, you know, how they all shrank to like really skin and bones. Yeah. One of the stories I came across was how, you know, a bunch of them, when they sent out the work parties, these guys would collect lalang. Right. So these guys, you know, uh, invented a grinder mm -hmm. to grind down the lalang and drink lalang juice because the doctors told them there was vitamin C in it. A shortage of vitamin C leads to scurvy. Mm. The prisoners also grew, tried to grow vegetables, but of course, you know, in, in the prison camp, quite clearly, the amount of land is mm. limited. And uh, we're going to be making the tapioca noodles. And uh, what, what's the other dish called? What, what, would, you, what would you call it? <laughs> uh, boiled tapioca. Boil, just boiled tapioca. <laughs> I mean, it is literally yeah. just boiled. Right. What I tried to do was, I tried not to use any ingredient that did not exist in Japanese occupied Singapore. Are you ready to get into the kitchen with me and so we can start making these dishes and try them? Alright. <laughs> Alright, let's, let's go. go. Is that you have some ingredients laid out for us. So maybe you can run us through. For the tapioca dish, mm -hmm. for the noodles, we mm -hmm. start with uh, tapioca. Okay. Got you a bit need ahead of myself. To first peel this tapioca. It's very like a bark almost. It actually consists of two layers. One is this brown papery thing, which you don't want, and then there's another layer which you also don't want. Okay. It's this one. So what you want to do is to get to the bottom of it. You want to try and do this? Okay, sure, yes. Let me let me do it. Let's cut this in half wow. so it's easier to handle. Okay. okay, this one here, yeah? Yeah. Okay. You need to peel. dig into it thinly and pull. Yes. Is that too much? <laughs> that, that is too much because you don't want to cut into the flesh. Ah, okay. You want to get this part out. Mm -hmm. You see, like this. Ah, okay. Is this okay? Yes, like this? yes, that's it. Ah, yes. okay. Mm. Is this better using my hands like this? Mm -hmm. Okay. You need the knife, you see, to right. get into it, and then mm -hmm. after that, you just uh, push ah, it. Ah, oh yeah, then push it gets it a bit, up. Yeah. bit easier after that. In the center ah. is this fibrous thing, which you don't want because it's very woody. We can't eat this, it's too fibrous. No, it's, it's like chewing woody. on a mm. piece of string almost. Yep. There were eating stalls where they would serve this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, tapioca noodles. Mm -hmm. And which people complained about because they found it much too al dente for their taste. Ah. They were used to wheat and rice noodles, mm -hmm. which which are always much softer than tapioca noodles. I see. I've never okay. actually had tapioca noodles, so this will be my first time trying it. So now, now it's we to can boil. let it boil. It's the same process for making the dessert as well. In those days, you probably had to make your own tapioca starch. Mm. And tapioca starch is actually very easy to make. You need to grate the whole tapioca, clean thing, yep. and then you grate it. Because in those days, they had graters, which was a piece of aluminum yeah. with uh, spikes in it. Mm -hmm. And you just rub grate against it. Grate it over a bowl. Yeah. Or just turn this basically into a paste. Yes. After you've you grated grate it, it you mix it with water. And then you just So then you separate. get this to separate oh. these three layers. What happens is you then get this. You see the bottom part here is the starch. Yes. Oh. So you discard the water mm -hmm. and then you dry it. The process of preparing this, grating this and waiting for it to separate like that, did it take a very long time? It just a, seems like a very... It's something you can process. do overnight. Overnight. So yeah. you just grate, you just let water, let pour sit. water yeah, in it yeah, and let yeah, it sit yeah, overnight yeah. and the next day you yeah. do the next step. So once this thing has boiled nicely, this is cooked already. Okay. This. This stuff becomes this. Right, so if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, and we need to boil this for about half an hour, you see? About half an hour. And then it will really just end soft. up looking like this. So after boiling it, it all becomes a soft tapioca. It becomes soft nice tapioca, which can be mashed. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, something like this, would there be enough nutrients for someone eating it? 
No. What's most There famous? was some analysis that I came across that said that tapioca has trace amounts of iron. Okay. That was about it. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike rice, there's really? a lot more nutrients in it. Okay. You know, so it's like about equal parts of tapioca starch. Yeah. And that. Okay, so I just plop the whole thing on top. Yes. Okay. So what you're doing now is you're kneading the mashed up the starch boiled into tapioca the boiled into the tapioca. Starch. Yeah. Then we need another pot of boiling water. Okay, sure. I'll get come there. So the tapioca starch will hold the boiled tapioca mm -hmm. together okay. and form uh, this cake. Ah, so that's what the starch is for? Yes. Because if you just simply mash the thing, it's not going to oh, hold. It will end up just disintegrating again. Right? It will fall apart. Ah. We can do the same thing with a sweet potato, mm -hmm. which will be slightly more nutritious but also more colourful. Okay, this is boiled sweet potato mm -hmm. and it is a downside easier to do than the uh, tapioca. What you do is you then push it in here. Should I break it apart? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'm breaking it apart. It's easier, I mean you just simply use your hands. Okay. Mix it in with, uh, again same thing, about equal amounts. Okay. Oh, the starch feeling is so... It's not like a powder almost, it's like... Yeah. And I'm mixing in like this, and yep. I'm doing it right. Mm. I've been kneading it with my hands. So there's no secret to this, right? I'm just, no. just using my hands. And you notice there's no, there are no measuring scales or any such yeah, thing, Yeah, right? I realise. You haven't told me one single measure because this whole time. <laughs> in those days, everybody used the agar-agar method. Yeah. Right? Yeah. One rice bowl of this, or, you know, one teaspoon, and they don't mean those official... Measuring... Five mil teaspoons. Yeah, it was yeah. whatever teaspoon you had sitting in the house. Yes. It's quite fun actually, now I feel like I play with Play-Doh. Yep, just drop it in. Just drop it in? Mm. And how long do we boil this for? Basically when it starts to float up, mm -hmm. it's about okay. I love how agar-agar this recipe is. Yes. I can see it floating up already. So that's how we know it's done. Yes, so what you do is you then cut it into little strips like this. Mm -hmm. And it's so tough, huh? it's really like, it's like a jelly almost. So if we were to eat this now, would it taste like anything? Well, you could try. Is okay, it... I'll try. No, I mean it's cooked. It's cooked, no, it's right? It's cooked, raw. right? It's yeah, safe it's to eat, raw. right? Oh yeah, it's safe to eat. Okay, I'll just try this. It just doesn't have much flavour lah. It's like eating plain jelly. It's like a cake. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Would it be sweeter for the sweet potato one? Slightly. Okay, this one's a bit cold now. There you go. It would be slightly sweet. Mm. But there is some flavour. Yeah. Yeah. Mmm. It's it. different from this. Yes. Mm. So what's the the ginger is one of the aromatics that they will use. Yes. Because it's easy to grow. So this ginger, we're thinly slicing them. Also again, same principle. Mm -hmm. The idea was to use a little bit to spread the flavours. So Stretch if you do it, it small, mm. you know, everybody everybody got a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. So we need a small amount of oil. So we're frying these until the Ginger is going in. And then these these were clams that we foraged. Theoretically. Yes, we foraged these clams. <laughs> Some water. This is fish sauce. Okay. The flavouring agent that we would have used then would have been fish sauce because you can make your own fish sauce. Oh, good. They're opening up nicely. Okay. And then lastly, we put in the Chinese celery that we picked up on our way back from the beach. No, we grew them in our oh, garden. Oh, we grew them in our garden. Hello. Yes, yes. Okay, we're done. Okay. Now, we're doing the dessert. And this is some of the tapioca that we prepared just now that has been already softened and boiled. The boiled tapioca, yes. Mm -hmm. So now we're just adding... We're just adding some palm sugar. Mm -hmm. So how much palm sugar? Or if it's based on the eye and the feel? It's uh, based on your taste. My dad loved steam. Tapioca. Steamed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the tapioca plants that he planted in the, the backyard, you know, when he harvested, they would be steamed and then he would uh, put grated coconut over it uh -huh. and some sugar. So we're just sort of reducing this almost. So at which point do we add the grated coconut? Oh, at this here. When already. it's like that. Oh, yeah. so we can add it now actually? This one here. I mean, the humble tapioca. Yeah is nevertheless quite tasty. Uh. Yeah. You can do nice things to it, I think. It's a unique taste too. Like once you taste it, you know it's tapioca, isn't it? Okay, so I'm sprinkling 
the grated coconut over this. So just like that actually, we've created a, a two-course meal basically. And yes, our dessert. One ingredient, two dishes. <laughs> that comes too. But it's... It's really clever. To me, this is acceptably al dente. Okay, it's not that chewy actually. Mm, it's got a nice sweetness there. Mm. You know when I see these sweet potatoes and tapioca, I'm brought back to my days in primary school. Mm. Where you know in primary school, they would have uh, this thing called Total Defence Day. Ah uh, yes, I know. Sort of part of the national education element of the school curriculum, right? I remember the canteen would switch all the normal food that they had and they would just serve you tapioca, sweet potatoes. Yeah, and it's part of the national education to like, you know, teach the kids like this is what your grandparents ate ah. during the wartime, you okay. know, as, as a way to, to teach the kids about mm. the war. Mm. So my impression of wartime food was from that. And they would serve you these little chunks of sweet potato or tapioca that was boiled or steamed. And then that would be it. But I didn't think that you know, it could ever taste like this. Would you say that what we've done today was probably closer to what some people with a bit more imagination and ingenuity could do themselves? Definitely. Mm -hmm. There were eateries mm -hmm. where, you know, you would have had hawkers who produced their own noodles. Mm. So this could have been something that they could have made mm -hmm. and sold as a dish in their eatery. Right. Because there's not much else. Mm. So it's the same ingredients, same same ingredient, yeah. that everyone had access to. It's, it's just all. how creative you want it to be. It's it. down to the imagination of the cook. Yeah, it's like they could take away all your food supplies, they could take away your rice, they could take away your rations, your rations, but they could never take away your imagination. Yeah, almost. yeah. I want to try the dessert also actually. <laughs> Like it's really nice. For some reason, my mum talked a lot about eating tapioca. Mm -hmm. She was never as enthusiastic about it as my dad. But one thing she did do often, and that was kuih bingka, mm -hmm. which is a tapioca based thing, mm -hmm. you know? We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you for traveling back in time with us to learn about how people coped with wartime food shortages. And thank you, Gyokboy, for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm Patty, and this is From Book to Cook.